my name is Todd Barr, the Chief Marketing Officer of Chainlink Labs, and uh, I get to have a fun conversation today about everyone's favorite topic, AI. And uh, I've got two uh, excellent guests with me today. One is uh, Lawrence Moroni. Uh, Lawrence is a former uh, global AI advocacy lead for Google, and he, al he also hosted our AI symposium last year at our Barcelona SmartCon. And then Professor Jack Poon, um, who I was excited to meet uh, earlier this year at uh, Hong Kong Polytech University, and is also a blockchain uh, expert and uh, teaches blockchain courses at Hong Kong Polytech. So nice to see you again, uh, Professor Poon. Um, so uh, let's start off. I'm, I'm already going to go off script, guys. So. <laughs> Uh, let's start off with uh, where are you on AI is uh, going to uh, take over the world uh, versus and by when or uh, AI is this amazing innovation uh, that's just going to continue to help humanity. Let's just get, can I get your temperature check on uh, that and then we'll go into how we, uh, how we address blockchain and AI. So maybe Lawrence, we'll start with you uh, and then turn it over to Jack. Yeah, I guess if I were to draw it on a spectrum of like, you know, on one side of the spectrum is Terminator and AI taking over the world, and then the other side of the spectrum is Utopia, you know, I would say it's probably like a three or a four. Um, and I think, you know, the, the potential with AI and the potential of how we can change industry, education, employment, lifestyle, healthcare, all of that kind of good stuff with AI is there but also the potential for misuse is there. And so I think, you know, it takes responsible building, responsible execution and, and responsible leadership uh, to be able to do this correctly and to, to, to lean closer towards the utopian side than the dystopian side. Yes, Professor Poon. So uh, the way I look at AI is the following, right? So uh, if you look at the development of uh, technology in the last uh, N number of years, right? Um, PC kind of started back in 1980s with Apple creating the uh, Apple computers, and then it didn't. It takes around 10 years until 1990s before it take off, and the ramp up probably lasted around 20 plus years till 2010 or 2020 or so. And then similarly for smartphone, I think uh, the smart device concept actually started somewhere in the early 2000s. It takes around 10 years until Steve Jobs put together the smartphone and then it takes off uh, from that point on. Um, AI unfortunately actually started in the 1950s. It <laughs> kind of goes nowhere for a long time. Uh, until in the 2015 or so, when someone come up with the concept of batch normalizations, and then uh, we have DeepMind uh, beating the, the, the smartest human being on chess, and then in 2022, then chat GPT kind of take off. So from that standpoint, you can kind of look at it as that AI just reaches the tipping point of really going to change how we do things in the next 20 years. So from that perspective, that there will be actually a lot of application that AI will be on anywhere, anytime, all over the place within the device that we will be seeing and within the application we will be seeing. So that is really the trend of where we're heading. We are really, really at the early stage. A um, couple of weeks back, I listened to Jensen's, one of his talk. What he mentioned was that 40% of his computation power contribute to inference. Now, inference is when you prompt a chat GPT type of robot, it kind of tells you what is the answer. Now, 60% is currently used on training. But if you imagine the populations that we have over a billion people on smart device, the amount of penetration and inference is really, really low. So going forward, if he is only spending 40% of his computation power on inference with about 1 billion people uh, on smart device and probably 4 billion people on internet, this growth is going to be really, really huge. So we are just really at the a very early stage of touching what is going to be for AI. Yeah, it's, a, and it's an amazing fact that just, I think, 18 to 20 months ago, NVIDIA's largest business was still gaming. 
And I think uh, now AI is you know, 10x that business in, yes. in 18, 24 months. So very early, like you said, I agreed. So it seems like blockchain has been developing almost parallel to AI, and the, t the two haven't met up very much until now there seems to be a narrative that blockchain can be a governor, if you will, on AI and the misuse, as you were talking about, Lawrence. What excites you about the convergence of these two technologies, and how do you see them uh, coming together? Maybe Professor Poon will start with you this time. Okay, so if you look at the concept of AI, right, it started with this transformer model, and there are some really famous people who kind of say, well, transformer model is really a commodity. Uh, to a large extent, majority of the time, uh, spending on how you push data through this commodity type of technologies. And the thing that really differentiates between one LLM model from another LLM model is really the data. Okay, so data is really the key differentiation of what your LLM model will be. And the quality of the data is the most important part that you will be concerned about. If you have poor quality feeding into the model, essentially it's garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so one of the conversions about blockchain is that blockchain actually help us to define the integrity of the data. And with that, that's actually help us to carry, to trust whatever the model actually will generate come from a legitimate source that people can rely on. I'll let Lawrence expand on that. Yes, feel free. Yeah, I think um, I, really great, great answer, first of all, thanks. Um, I think one of the things that I would like to point out is um, Professor Poon mentioned like how PC industry took off, how the mobile phone industry took off, and how the AI industry took off. And I'm, I'm, I see a commonality between all of these, and I'll add the internet to that. And the commonality is when the ability to be able to build for that platform, access to that got widened. You know, my career got launched by a thing called Visual Basic. Um, I mean, the early wind seas had made it very easy for you to program them with Visual Basic. Like, the internet really took off with the advent of HTML and JavaScript. TCP IP had been around for decades before the web browser came about and the ability to build for that and build distributed applications. Mobiles had been around for a long time until the advent of the App Store when it became profitable for developers to be able to build something and Apple widened access to developers to be able to build easily. And similarly with AI, like back in 2016, I was working on, with Google and we measured that there were 300,000 AI practitioners in the world, um, but there were 30 million software developers. And you know, I formed a thesis that if we can bring AI to software developers, we'll easily 10X the number of AI developers, right? From 300,000 to 3 million. And then so we released and we open sourced something called TensorFlow. And again, to widen access to make it easy for developers to be able to use and to build AI on AI. And as a result, you know, those developers ended up being the ones who trained the original transformers, who then went on to form open AI, you know, and it created ChatGPT, which is, puts us in the situation that we are now. So now if we think about the convergence of AI and blockchain, you know, here's where the same thing can happen. Right. So, you know, blockchain and the ability to build for blockchain was in the hands of relatively few people until recently. And now with the ability for more developers to be able to build for more platforms and with some of the announcements we've been seeing at SmartCon this week, that widening of access to be able to build on chain, I think is one of the things that that same pattern will be followed so that it can really, really help chain take off. Um, so then now do we, where do we see the convergence of AI and blockchain? And I agree with uh, Professor Poon around the fact that, you know, you need good data to be able to build good models, but good data does not guarantee good models. You can still train bad models with good data. So the ability not only to be able to audit the stuff going into the model, but to be able to audit and understand and analyze the stuff coming out of the model is very, very important. And so to be able to do that, like by, for example, doing things like driving consensus, the way that the recent projects um, that Chainlink spoke about with like asset servicing and other things like that is where we're beginning to see this beautiful interaction between the two of them, um, two being blockchain and AI, of course, and the ability for one, for two plus two equals five synergy to happen between the two. And that's why I'm particularly excited today. But I think the key to that is making it as easy as possible for more and more people to build on a trusted platform and to be mm -hmm. able to succeed at it. And then you'll replicate what Microsoft did with Windows, what Apple did with iPhone, what Google did with TensorFlow, um, and all those things, and everybody can benefit. 
Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, let's go a little deeper on uh, the, so there was the garbage in, garbage out sort of piece of this, but then there's the other end, which is sort of verifying the output of the AI on the other side. Um, last week at Cybos, uh, Chainlink announced a, uh, a study and a pilot that was done with Swift and Euroclear and a number of banks and asset managers like Franklin Templeton and UBS where uh, they took unstructured data, turned it into structured data, had LM, LLMs analyze it, and then had a consensus mechanism on the other side that would verify the truth. So, Lawrence, could you talk a little bit about the impact of that and, and possibly how that would be a solution, uh, or at least part of the solution? Sure. So, I mean, I'll, I'll begin with like just taking unstructured data and building software to turn unstructured data into structured, actionable data is very slow and very expensive, right? Because unstructured data comes in so many different yeah. forms. It's you know, from PDFs to spreadsheets to who knows what, to source code, you know, whatever. Um, every time you get a new piece of data, you probably have to write a new piece of code to be able to parse that. It's slow and expensive. So the part of the promise of large language models and transformer-based models is their ability to do what I call artificial understanding. Um, so it's like they're not really understanding it, they're artificially understanding the contents of a document. And when they artificially understand the contents of the document, then you can start begin to extract the data that you're interested in from the document and effectively turn unstructured data into structured data by using an LLM as an artificial understanding engine to do so. However, um, by doing this, as we all know, we're still in day one of AI and large language models, and we've all heard the word hallucination. Now the idea is that you know, these models could potentially hallucinate while extracting structured data, and they can be very confidently incorrect in so doing. So the idea of this project um, was, and, and it's very innovative, was that, but it's, it's, it's as simple as it's innovative, was, well, if you ask multiple models um, or multiple combinations of model and prompt for the answer, then what you can start doing is driving something a lot like the scientific process, right? The scientific process involves a person comes up with a theory of something, they come up with evidence to back up that theory, and then they get challenged by others to be able to defend that evidence. And if enough others form a consensus that this theory is correct, it becomes accepted. Now think about doing that artificially. So you have a number of LLMs doing an artificial understanding of an unstructured document, pulling something out of it. You can then start mathematically calculating if there is consensus amongst these by looking at the embeddings or looking at other factors of the output of the model. And you know, if you can start seeing that there are outliers from this consensus and maybe more outliers than things that are closer to the vector of truth, then you can begin to see that your models are hallucinating really badly and can, you can create a feedback loop to make them better. Or if a number of things are like, you know, roughly in the same direction, thereby showing mathematically a consensus between them, now you can begin to trust that you've actually filtered out the effects of hallucination. And as a result, now you can greatly cut the cost and complexity of turning that unstructured data into structured data. And again, it's a, and then once you have that structured data, you can put that on chain as a golden truth. And again, we have that beautiful intersection between AI and uh, blockchain with a bit of innovative software development to bring the best out of both of them. Yeah, anything to add to that, Professor Poon? Yeah, uh, definitely, right? So to create a source of truth and then pass through the model. So from a research standpoint, oftentimes that if we look at some of the output, what we always want to do is to somehow go and to be able to verify what the source is. Mm -hmm. So with the way the blockchain is being structured, even though there potentially is some hallucination going on, we would be able to actually go back to the source of the information and say, yes, is that what we expect? We will be able to detail, examine the details, whether there is something may have gone wrong in the process. So that part really is what we always are looking for, is whether the data that we have is good source of data or are they really representing what is really going on? Right. It feels like in this, in this example, we're, we're going all the way from unstructured data to a verifiable truth based on consensus on chain, and we're using these technologies for what they're both good at. But, we're help, but you know, neither one of them uh, is complete for the whole solution here. Um, so it's a really interesting uh, approach. Is there anything else, I mean, we haven't talked about open source yet. 
Are there any other governors on AI other than just blockchain that you think are important for us to continue to move forward? Is, is it open source software in answer to this? Um, Lawrence, what do you think is, uh, are some of the other uh, governors on AI? So yeah, great question. Um, so I think you know, the open source software can be a solution to this. Um, open source models can be a better solution to this. Um, however, the open source when it comes to AI and models right now is a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, where a lot of companies generally release a model and they release the weights and you can download it and you can use it yourself and they call it open source. But we don't see the architecture of the model. We don't see the source that was used to train it. And most importantly, we don't see the data and particularly how that data was pre-processed in order to be able to train it. You know, they can say they just trained it on this heap or that heap, but unless you know how they're pre-processed, it's, it's like you just don't know. So I think there's definitely um, the potential uh, for the industry to be much more open about how they release uh, models and how they've trained models and what data that they've used, but that potential is still to be realized. Um, I think when it comes for good government, so go back to like something that Jack mentioned, and that's the ability for us to um, work back through the model to try to figure out why the transformer gave the answer that it gave. Mm. And there's a lot of research going on in that space where it's a case of now you can see that, hey, sequence A led to sequence B, a large language model just basically predicts the next set of tokens given a first set of tokens. Um, and you know, research to be able to walk backwards through that is ongoing. Um, and I think if that research is made more open and if that research is uh, more monetized, um, I think you know, you're going to see a new suite of tools and a new suite of startups who will be out there really helping uh, the industry as a whole be better. Um, and you know, I think to go back to the project that we were just talking about, there's, you know, one of the things that made ChatGPT what it is and the success that it is, is a technique called reinforcement learning through human feedback or RLHF. But what we're beginning to see here is really the beginnings of a reinforcement learning through machine feedback. Uh, when we start being able to drive this type of consensus and then if we're putting consensus truths on chain and those truths are being heavily used because they're trusted, we are now going to see the seeds of what make, you know, for example, in this case of extracting uh, structured data from unstructured data for corporate actions, you're going to begin to see what it is about the models and how to use those models that makes it effective for that. And then that learning becomes the next thing for building the next generation of models mm -hmm. and making them better. And all of that is in the open when it's done with that golden truth on chain. So, you know, the, some beautiful seeds are being laid there for a future openness that's easier to govern, but we're still working towards that. So closing the loop with on-chain data essentially being a source of truth that helps chain, uh, train the next iterations of the model. Well, we're about out of time here. Yeah, sorry, we're about out of time here. I apologize, Lawrence. Uh, but with any last thoughts uh, for you, Professor Poon? Um, I, I subscribe to what Lawrence was saying. Yeah. The only thing I want to add to that is among all these technology that we have, there is definitely a human component to it. Even though we have a lot of automations, the human actually play a very important part in helping to navigate how the data go through the model, get trained, and how it gets to the users. And it's also very important for us to make sure that the people who is involved in that process doesn't pollute the model, doesn't specifically bias the model to one certain aspect, and safely deploy these type of technology to the general public. Thank you. Lawrence, any last words? Uh, I couldn't say it any better than Professor Poon just did, so uh, no, nothing else to add to that. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you for your time and your attention on this. And uh, it's an exciting feature with these two technologies. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.